The messages you are about to hear were first given on our daily radio broadcast. Dr. Woodrow Kroll is the speaker, and this series of four messages is entitled, Hallelujah, Psalms of Praise. The first message is on the subject, Great is the Lord. Here's Dr. Kroll. Thank you, Herman Rolfs, and thank you too, friends, for joining us on this broadcast of Back to the Bible. Have you ever said the word, Hallelujah? Well, if you have, you've said a good Hebrew word. And if you have, you have praised the Lord at the same time. The unfortunate thing is there are a lot of people who use the word hallelujah who have no idea what it means, no idea that they're praising God. Praise the Lord. Now, the Hebrew word hallelujah is just a combination of the words for praise and the personal name of God. And we're looking this week at the halal. The halal are the last five psalms of the Psalter. Psalm 146, 147, 148, 149, and that final hymn of praise, Psalm 150. Now today we want to look at Psalm 147 and praise the Lord. That's what this week is all about, expressing our thanksgiving to the Lord God. If you have opportunity to have a Bible in front of you, I invite you to look at Psalm 147. If not, listen carefully, because this is a psalm that was written specifically to praise the Lord at some good thing he had done for Israel. It's a psalm that was written at the dedication of the city wall. You remember that when Nehemiah came back to the city of Jerusalem after being in Babylonian captivity, it was Nehemiah's direction from the Lord God to rebuild the wall around the city, Nehemiah chapter 12. And when he did that, he established the gates of the city. He erected bars at the gates in order to hold those gates up. Gates were established for security and for the prosperity of the city. We know that from Nehemiah chapter 7. Well, Psalm 147 appears to have been written at the dedication of those gates. In fact, verse 2 may be an allusion to that. Verse 2 says, The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. It's a psalm of great joy, a psalm of great praise to the Lord God. And you and I have the same kind of responsibility to praise God that Nehemiah and the people of Israel did. We want to have the same kind of relationship to God that they did. One of the interesting things about this psalm is that the name of God appears in this psalm in four different varieties. He is called Yahweh, Jehovah. He is called Yah. He is referred to as Elohim and as Adonai. So you have four names for God, four occasions on which God is identified in this psalm. The psalm divides itself into three stanzas, which makes it easy for our study today. Each stanza begins with a note of praise. If you notice, verse 1 is a note of praise, praise the Lord. Verse 7, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. And then again, notice at verse 12, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Now, these three verses begin each of the three stanzas of the psalm. The psalm tells us to praise God because he is a God who helps people. Wouldn't it be awful to worship a God who is made of stone? Wouldn't it be awful to worship a God made of wood or metal? Wouldn't it be awful to worship a God who is not personal, not interested in you, but you and I have a relationship with a God who helps people. And that's what Psalm 147, verses 1 through 6, tell us about. Notice with me. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely or beautiful. Praise is fitting. It's all right to praise God. In fact, it's good to praise God. It is fitting to praise God. It is pleasant to praise God. Of course, the only problem is we tend not to praise him as often as we should. And maybe we don't because we forget just how great a God he is. Well, this psalm will help us remember what a great God he is. Notice in verse 2, he talks about the kind of God that we are to praise. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. What kind of a God do we praise well, Jehovah is the kind of God who is the God of the downtrodden, the outcast. The word outcast here is a Hebrew word which means to push down, to overthrow. 
It's someone who has been pushed down all his life, someone who has been kicked out of here and out of there, someone who has been pushed around a lot. These outcasts of Israel were brought back to Jerusalem when the wall was built, and the reference here, historically, is to bringing back the Jews from Babylonian captivity. But you and I can identify with this, can't we? Have you been pushed around a lot? Have you been put down a lot? Maybe at work or in your family or in your community. Maybe because you love the Lord and those around you do not, you feel like you've been downtrodden. Well, my friends, God is the God of those who are downtrodden. He gathers together the outcasts. God really cares for you. And we're to praise him because he's that kind of God. He is a God who cares for the downtrodden. Verse 3 tells us he is a God who cares for the brokenhearted. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Now, this is quite a God. Not only is he the God of the downtrodden, but he's the God of those who have a broken heart as well. You know, Jehovah is not only the rebuilder of the walls, he's also the healer of the heart as well. He is a God who is very interested in people. And if your heart is broken today, broken by children who are not living for the Lord, children who have walked away from God, if your heart is broken today because of a failed relationship, if your heart is broken because a husband has walked away from you or a wife has walked away from you, if your heart is broken because of some situation in your church today, may I remind you that you need to praise the Lord God because He is the God of the brokenhearted as well as the God of the downtrodden. He's that kind of God. Verse 4 tells us that he is the God of the heavens. He counts the number of the stars, or tells the number of the stars, and calls them all by name. Now, when it says he counts the number of stars, that simply means that he assigns or he appoints orbits to each of the stars. Job said of God, he alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He made the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades. Job chapter 9, verse 9. Now, this is quite a God. He is worthy of our praise. Not only because he helps the downtrodden and the brokenhearted, but because he is the God of heaven. He's the one who puts the stars in their orbits. In fact, friends, he even determines what their orbits should be. And notice it says he calls them all by name. Now, we have a habit in humanity of when a star or a planetary body is discovered, we usually name it after the discoverer. And that's all right. I'm not opposed to that at all. But what a shock it's going to be one day when we find out what God has really called these stars. Can you imagine the immensity of a God who can call by name every one of his planetary bodies that he's created? That God, friends, that God is worthy of our praise. He's the God of the brokenhearted, the God of the downtrodden. He's the God of heaven. Notice verse 5 says he is great. Great is our Lord and great in power or mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Now that tells me God is also the God of the intellect. Great is the Lord. The Hebrew word that is used for great here is the word for high or lofty. And the second half of that verse, the word is great as well, but here the word is for abundant. What it means is simply this. Our high and lofty God is abundant in power. You never have to worry about God running out of power. It just isn't going to happen, friends. He is a great God and worthy to be praised. So the God who never runs out of power always has power to lift up the downtrodden. The God who never runs out of power always has power to heal the brokenhearted. He's the God who put the stars in space. He calls them all by name. He is the God of intellect. Don't you feel sorry for all those today, those humanists, those evolutionists, those social reformers, those who feel that their minds are the ultimate goal of their life? and they have thought God out of their processes. What a shame, because they have tried to be more intellectual than they can possibly be. They've tried to be more intellectual than God, but God is a God of infinite understanding. He understands their problem, but friends, he's also made a solution to that problem. That solution is the Lord Jesus. 
God is the God of the intellect. God is the God of the meek. Verse 6, the Lord lifts up the meek or the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Now, when it says he lifts up the humble here, it literally means that he duplicates or he repeats to the humble. That's to say God repeats himself to the humble. He encompasses those who are given to humility. He restores them. The meek, the humble, never run dry of God. There is always more to go around. God is the God who helps people. So, you are a people today, and I'm a people today. I can look forward to God's help for me. No wonder I want to have a relationship with this kind of God. And no wonder the Bible calls us to praise our great God. Well, beginning at verse 7 is the second section of this. I'm going to spend less time here because it talks about God being the God who cares for his creation. And while we're part of that creation, I think it's more important for us to understand that he cares for us as people. Notice verse 7, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, sing praises on the harp to our God who covers the heavens with the clouds, who prepares rain for the earth. Who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives the beast its food and to the young ravens that cry. Now, what he's talking about here is the cycle of life, the cycle of nature. God begins this cycle when he covers the heavens with clouds. And although we understand the formation of clouds through natural processes, oh, folks, it's not Mother Nature. It's Father God who creates the clouds. And from the clouds, God prepares rain for the earth. That rain, in turn, makes the grass grow on the high mountains, providing both ground cover and food for the animals. And then God gives the life cycle an additional boost when he gives all the beasts of the field their food and the young ravens the cry. Now, the Creator is also the director of this great drama of life. Creator and sustainer are one. Praise God who creates, but praise God who sustains as well. That means then that God cares for all of his creation, not just for man. And we should care for all of God's creation. But we do not worship man and we do not worship creation. We worship God. God does not delight, verse 10, in the strength of the horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of a man. He takes pleasure in those who fear him, not fearing horses and not fearing men. Now, probably this is a reference to military strength, a reference to the warriors who trust in their cavalries and monarchs who trust in their infantry, the legs of horses and the legs of men. Instead of being so enamored with our industrial strength or our military strength, we have to rely more upon God because God ultimately is the one who raises one power and puts down another. So he says, praise the Lord God because he is a God who helps people and praise him because he is a God who cares for his creation. Now, finally today, verse 20 to the end of this psalm tells us that we ought to praise God because he is a God who loves Israel, his chosen people. Verse 12, praise the Lord, O Jerusalem, praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates and has blessed your children within you. He makes peace in your borders and fills you with the finest wheat. Now, isn't that odd? God strengthens the bars and the gates, those strong wooden beams that would be positioned along either side of the city gate. Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 3. Also the sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Now, that's a historical reference to what he's talking about here in verse 13. But the thing that I find strange is that he makes reference to peace being in the borders of Jerusalem. With the completion of the city wall by Nehemiah, Jerusalem entered a period of peace. But there's a real sense, folks. There is a real sense in which peace only comes when God comes within our borders as well. When he enters our life, Isaiah 26, verse 3 promises, You will be kept in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. When we place our trust in Jesus Christ and believe that God has paid the penalty for our sins through the sacrifice of Christ, 
then peace comes on the inside, surrounding us, sustaining us. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, the people of Israel need to know the peace of God. All they can look forward today is to a peace that is negotiated. But dear friends, God loves his people. That's why in verse 19 he concludes this psalm by saying he declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. But notice he concludes by saying, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Even though God's people have not known him the way they should, God still opens his heart and his arms to them and calls them back to him today. Praise God today for his greatness to you. He's a God who loves people. He's a God who cares for his planet, his creation. He's a God who loves Israel. 